Hello everyone, welcome to Gotieran TV in this very special edition of this playlist. We're here at week number six in this data analysis of this special research study that I've been sharing with you for the last five weeks. And here in week number six, we're going to be talking about participant number six as well as the sixth of ten key strategic points that will be shared with you. So again, as I mentioned, we've been knocking these out in the last five weeks and we've made it all the way to week six of 10 in this playlist. And the sixth key strategic point in the dissertation is the description of the phenomena. Most importantly, what is this study all about? I mentioned to you that this study is a qualitative methodology using a descriptive design. And therefore, I said this earlier, uh, early on, in fact, that the study itself wasn't looking Looking so much at numbers and statistics and numerical values and such, but rather we were focusing on the how and why when interviewing these participants. Just to give you an idea of what that looks like, in thematic analysis is what it's called. This is what I used to do what's called coding when interviewing the participants. So just to give you a big picture of what that looks like and what's involved in research for a qualitative study using descriptive design, when I'm interviewing these clients and these participants who have been using a personal trainer, they have been providing all of the code words and phrases that I've been taking notes of along the interviews that last anywhere between 45 to 60 minutes. And the questions centered around what I spoke about last week, the research question and sub-research questions of this study dealing with self-determination as a contributor to realizing their personal training goals, as well as those sub-components of self-determination theory, which include autonomy, competence, and relationships. Relatedness. And thus, what I was able to provide at the very end of doing all of my coding and examining and cross-referencing all 10 clients and participants in their personal training program and all the answers they gave me to my research questions, I was able to provide a description of the phenomena. And what that looks like on one side of the screen, we can see that there are codes of some of those words that I was mentioning. These are words that were frequently put out and provided upon by the those participants when questioning them about to the right here of this picture the three components of as you can see self-determination theory in the heart of it talking about the contributors and the three different of the Venn diagram here you see autonomy competence and relatedness so a lot of the questions that were dissected and again asked to each of the participants had to focus on the different unique qualities of autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And that's how it was provided to give a full holistic picture of the description of the phenomena. And again, that's what we've been talking about. That's what my study had to do with motivation. How do millennials in Atlanta, Georgia, realize their personal training goal when it comes to self-determination? Things like intrinsic motivation, working with a personal trainer, having independence, masterfully feeling competent and confident in their workouts. And how does that relationship look like with their personal trainer? Were they satisfied with those goals? Did they achieve them? And if so, how was their self-determination as a contributor? And I mentioned all of the data that went into it with the instruments and sources of instruments that included the demographic questionnaire as well as the basic psychological satisfaction needs frustration scale survey that they had already filled out. And that's what led us to all 10 of these participants providing very good, fruitful, enriched data and answers that just helped us give a unique look and perspective of this description of phenomena. And so again, that's what I'm so happy and excited to share with you today as we talk to participant number six here momentarily. And remember, please make sure to like this video, leave us a comment, and share it with all your friends and family out there. And without any further ado, here comes participant number six as we delve more into the description of the phenomena. So I'm recording right now on Zoom. I have my participant on the call. Can my participant go ahead and please verify? Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great. Well, I want to thank you very much for your time. And um, this discussion here on this interview won't take more than 40 to 60 minutes. It's going to be a lot of open-ended questions. And um, at any time, if you need to stop the interview, uh, it's uh, your own choice, your own free will that you can stop this interview at any time. And if you have any questions uh, at all, there'll be some time at the end of the interview to ask questions or comment on the interview itself. 
Um, so before we start the interview, please allow me a few minutes here just to tell you about the purpose of this interview and uh, how this interview is going to go. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time and your participation in not only filling out our demographic questionnaire and the survey that you filled out, but also being able to uh, now uh, take us up on the offer of interviewing you to further explore um, kind of the psychology of your answers from that survey as it relates to your personal training program. Um, I want to first start by asking you, um, and this is just a yes or no uh, question, um, were you provided the informed consent form for that survey that you filled out? Yes, I was. Okay. And did you understand everything on that survey without any questions? Yes, I did. Okay. And uh, also, were you provided a informed consent form for the interview that I'm about to ask you? I did. Okay, and the same question follow up. Uh, do you acknowledge and understand everything on that informed consent form? Yes, I do. Wonderful. Okay, and um, the study purpose, just to let you know, is this is to examine how millennials like yourself describe self determination as a contributor to realizing their per current personal training goals. I do want to reiterate that your information is very valuable to helping us create a profile of millennials and overall how self-determination relates to attainment of personal training goals. Uh, we're going to basically provide and share the results of this study with each of the participants, and you're going to be given a descriptive summary of the conclusions we come to when we build an individual self-determination profile. Uh, we'll also send you the audio of this information interview in addition to the transcript for something called member checking. In other words, after our interview is done, I'm going to send you the interview so that that way you can both uh, listen to it and read it. And if there's anything that was needing more clarification or you'd like to revise, that's your opportunity to edit or change anything or add anything in. Uh, so that way, the context of all the answers you give us are to the best of your abilities. I do want to tell you there's no right or wrong answer in any of the uh, answers you're going to give us to the questions. These are all pretty much truly how you feel. There are a lot of very much how and why questions, very descriptive questions. Um, so now that we've addressed all of that, I want to let you know that your confidentiality will be maintained at all times. I will never ask you your name. You'll be anonymous. All of the information from our interview will be stored on an encrypted password protected computer, and it's only accessible to myself, who is the researcher. And um, before we jump into the interview questions, I do want to tell you at the end, we'll uh, confirm your demographic uh, questionnaire as well, just to make sure that we have everything straight on there. Let me tell you the overarching question that this study is exploring. How do millennials describe self-determination as a contributor to realizing their current personal training goals? Research question number one was how do millennials describe their self-determination in terms of autonomy, competence, and relatedness? You've answered this by providing the answers you gave us on that survey that you filled out uh, that had to do with autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Uh, as it's aligned to self-determination theory. So as we get closer to starting this interview process, I want to also let you know that I'm going to define some words for you more in layman's terms so that they make sense. Um, so when I ask you questions, I want to make sure that you're crystal clear on any of the definitions of the words. And if you need an example of how that word's used in a sentence or you need more clarification, please, uh, by all means, ask me so that I can give you more examples before you have to try to answer the question. So that way it's understood clearly. Um, so research question number two then brings us to the beginning and start of the interview. And that question is, how do millennials describe autonomy as a contributor to realizing their current personal training goals? Now, first of all, let's try to uh, go ahead and define what autonomy is. Autonomy, by definition through self-determination theory, is the desire to be causal agents of one's own life and act in harmony with one's integrated self. So what does that mean? That kind of means uh, to be autonomous, for lack of a better word, uh, or to have high autonomy is an individual who's very independent, an individual who has a sense of choice and freedom in the things that he or she undertakes. 
So let's use one of your answers from the survey that you gave us on the um, Likert scale uh, from, um, you know, one not true at all to five completely true. When we asked you, quote, I feel a sense of choice and freedom in the things I undertake, you gave us a very high score, which led to the reason why we've uh, decided to bring you here, because not only did you score highly on the self-determination survey, but you also scored high on your goal attainment. So that composite brought you to this short list. So since I'm under the impression you scored very high on your autonomy questions, let's now take a look at this with our questions through autonomy. My first question to you is this. Um, do you have an understanding of what autonomy means before I ask you the question? Yes, that's where you're able to make your uh, decisions on your own. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Excellent. So taking that into account, can you please describe whether you had some degree of autonomy or to what degree your autonomy was in your personal training program, whether it was none at all, small, moderate, large? What did autonomy look like, your degree of autonomy in personal training? Um, there was a trainer I did have that basically said, this is, we're going to go target, let's say, this muscle group. Uh-huh. Uh, you can either go out the, through a high intensity, low intensity. Okay. Uh, but we're still going to train the group and each way is going to be trained a little bit differently, but it's still going to target the same muscle group as the other would. Okay. So talking about that targeting muscle group then uh, for a minute, do you feel like that aligned with your own sense of choice and freedom? That, that does. And it also helped improve the, um, training sessions too, because I was able to put a little bit of input on stuff that I actually liked a little bit better than stuff I didn't like. Can you please provide us some examples of some of the things that you were able to give input in some of the things that you liked and some of the things you did not like? Okay. For instance, on the bench, <clears throat> I've got issues with the uh, left shoulder Okay. Uh, to where I can't, after a certain weight on the uh, barbell bench press, Mm -hmm. I, my shoulder will start to roll when I'm pushing it. Mm. But as long as we, we, even if I took the same weight and put them on dumbbells, I'd have no issues. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But so there, I was able to do a little bit modifications and the trainer was actually helping me with it to where I was able to still target the, basically the chest, the delts um, in the, in the same fashion. But with the uh, dumbbells, it actually gave a little bit better uh, freedom of movement on the shoulders that where it needed it. Mm, okay. Okay. Thank you. And let me ask you then this question. Um, in terms of, let's talk about your decisions and how your decisions reflect your wants. Would you then say, um, you know, how can you describe to us? how your decisions in your personal training program, were they a reflection of what you really wanted, would you say? Not necessarily what I really wanted. Okay. But they, they were there to give me a direction. Direction. And, and tell us a little bit more, please, in detail. What do you mean by direction and how that looks like? Okay. So when, when the trainer sit there, sit there says, well, we, to accomplish this goal, we will need to take, let's say, steps one, two, and three. Okay. Um, but let's say if you're good with step one, you're a little troubling with step two and you're fine with step three, he'll go back to step two and he'll play modifications to where we can still attain the step two goal, but in a different fashion. Interesting. Okay. Okay. How about, let me ask this question this way then, with this in terms of autonomy and um, with this personal training program, uh, how did you feel in terms of the choices that you expressed to the degree as how they defined you? So in other words, what I'm asking is, did you feel like your choices in your personal training programs were an expression of who you really are? Not necessarily, because I was in, the, I, I came to the trainer to reach a goal that I could on my own. Uh-huh, right. And not necessarily because I couldn't do it. It was the, uh, he was there to actually help me accomplish it within a short time frame. Well, as for, I might, I'm going to say procrastinate through the workout. Mm -hmm. Instead of where you take a one hour uh, workout where you have someone that's helping you, assisting you the whole time, mm -hmm. it might turn into two, two and a half hour workout. 
Okay. Well, then let me ask this question. Um, were there ever times that you just felt like during your personal training program that some of the exercises or routines felt like something that you had to do instead of wanted to do? Some of, yeah, some of them were like um, for warm ups, uh, cool downs. He would always put me on the treadmill, but I'm not a, I'm going to say a true runner. Okay. I do every once in a while, I'll get up and run races and stuff, but I'm not the person that will go out and just run miles at a time. Mm -hmm. But if it, for instance, if we put me on a uh, spin bike, I do much better on that. Okay. Um, so, so for instance, cycling is my cardio pick of choice. Uh -huh. Running's okay. Rowing's okay. Swimming's okay, but it's not my first pick. Okay. Okay. And how about this question then? And let's kind of uh, delve into this a little deeper. Did you ever have any times during your personal training program where you've maybe felt forced to do too many things that you wouldn't have chosen on your own? Yes. And that's one thing that the uh, personal trainer was hired for. He mm -hmm. was hired to push me past a limit that I didn't know I could pass. Mm. Mm-hmm. So he was able to actually, what I had as barriers or self-determined barriers, he was there helping me push past those, even though I know I couldn't. For instance, if once you get up so high in a bench press, I know I can't do this weight, but yeah, he had me do it and, and, and I couldn't do it, but yet he still had me try on it. And there were certain points on it where I was okay with it, but there were certain points during the movement that it's, it was just a complete failure, but he was there to actually help assist me through it. Mm, mm, okay, good, good. Well, how about this? When you look at your personal training program with your trainer, would you say then, um, I guess the question I have for you, and in, in, as far as interests are concerned, how much aligned was your personal training program to your own interests, to what really interested you? What was that alignment like with your personal training program? Um. Sometimes it felt like it was it lined correctly. Uh -huh. A lot of the times where I'm thinking, why do I have to do this exercise? Okay. It's not going to help me out. But in the longer run, it actually did. And these, these were things that that trainer was there to help push me with. And out of that, I did not understand it at first. But six months later in the line, I started to understand it. Did any time uh, come up where you felt like those exercises or your program was more like a chain of obligations that you were forced to do? Yeah. For instance, if I'm having a bad day and I really don't want to work out or if uh -huh. I just feel like uh, I've got other things going on that are just tiring me out mm -hmm. and I go there to do that and the trainer has everything set up, just pushing me, pushing me, pushing me uh, on days I really don't want to be pushed. Those are the times that I didn't feel the, uh, the training sessions were aligning with, with me internally. Mm -hmm. were, were there ever times where there were outside forces or anything external that caused uh, conflict or problems or um, any type of momentum loss to your personal training program that were beyond your control? Yeah, it's a, a, whether if I had a bad work day that affected me emotionally uh-huh um those are the days or if i want to say when i'd have a conflict with a co-worker mm. but carried on and once i left work a lot of people say just drop it after work but it it, it doesn't drop that easy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what about let's talk about pressure for a second um did you ever to uh, some degree or extent feel pressured that you were having to do any of the exercises during your program? Yeah, there were, there, was a, there were several times that I was pressured into doing stuff that I didn't know I could do mm -hmm. or I didn't like. But when, when I was having the uh, trainer work with me, he already had these programs on a daily basis or when I met with him that were mm -hmm. all predetermined. It wasn't as we'll go with this or like how, I ha how you were feeling at the time. Mm -hmm. But if you're feeling like, let's say, if you felt like you wanted to work on your legs, but no, you're stuck doing your upper body. Um, those are some of the things I didn't get 
um, correctly. Okay, well, let me ask this question then. Would you say that there were any times where you might have been given more increased options of exercises? And if so, did an increase of more choices and options of exercises also increase your own internal motivation? Yes, it did. It's, for instance, like running is not my choice of cardio. Uh huh. But even when, after doing it for a while, it just got easier and easier. My, my strides got more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is something I had to work up to. It's not something I could just go out and naturally get. Okay. Um, so the going through the, the different steps, through different types of training, platforms, uh, building up certain muscles in, let's say you're, uh, I'm going to say in my abdominal area, mm -hmm. actually helped to turn out my, uh, a little bit more effective running stride. Hmm. And let me ask you this at the very beginning of your program. Uh, when you look at autonomy, your own autonomous decision, you know, to, hire a personal trainer, work with a personal trainer, challenge yourself, um, do things that you didn't know you could do. How important was autonomy at the very beginning? And did it increase over time during your exercise program? I would say the, the degree of autonomy at first, I was going with what the trainer said. Okay. Even though I didn't like it. Uh-huh. Um, uh, he did give extra explanations on it, Okay. but at first I didn't like it, but over time, the, some of the exercises turned out to be stuff that I did like. It's just, I wasn't accustomed to doing them. Mm, mm, okay. And this question kind of is an overall question to your level of autonomy. Um, you know, when you look at that word autonomy, um, Thanks to autonomy, how successful then were you in your goal attainment of losing weight and body fat percentage during your personal training program and reaching your goals thanks to autonomy? Um, the autonomy wasn't there originally. Okay. So when oh, I'm going to put it this way. When I was doing the autonomy on my own, uh -huh. I wasn't getting the results I needed. Okay. But once I went with the trainer on it, uh, I started to see more results a little bit quicker because I wasn't able to make those decisions on certain exercise groups that, um, well, let's say certain muscle groups to where I think I'm getting a good, decent workout, but the workouts are just not uh, effective at targeting a certain area. Mm -hmm. It'd just be a hosh posh of different exercises. Okay. Whereas the trainer uh, took away that and he sit there and basically sit there and says, we're going to work on this group today. We'll do just your legs today instead of doing, let's say, let's say doing squats, bench presses and triceps on your arms. Mm -hmm. um, he was such a says, we're just going to do your legs today. Then we'll work on your back on the next day. Then we're going to do um, chest the next day, but we're just going to target certain areas. Uh, the autonomy, when I was doing it on my own, I didn't have any direction that way. Mm. I wasn't seeing the results I needed. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that word direction several times now. And let me ask you, putting that together, you also mentioned uh, the emotions uh, part of, you know, how you feel. When you talk about your results, like you just mentioned, and the emotions that you previously stated, and you also talked about your autonomy. Um, what does that all look like in terms of uh, how your personal trainer was during your program? Were you satisfied more so or were you frustrated more so when you look at all of those components combined? Uh, when you look at the components individually, mm -hmm. there's there could be, I'm going to say there was a lot more frustration at certain points. Okay. But when you look at the components as a group and as a total, there wasn't. Mm, mm, so the okay. overall effect, I, I've had to go through different emotions to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And if you broke down each one down individually, I could be frustrated with the ex exercise or if he's giving me a choice on this and we're at certain points, I don't want that choice. I just want you to tell me what to do. But then when you look six months down the line, it's I, I was getting results that I originally did not get. 
Oh, okay. Good, good. Well, let's move on then to the second component of self-determination theory. We've talked extensively here about autonomy. I want to go ahead and move forward and talk about competence for a minute. Um, on the competence portion of the survey, uh, you also scarred high on that. Uh, for example, just using one of the items where it says, I feel competent to achieve my goals. You gave a completely true five out of uh, five score on that one as well. And so uh, when we talk about now tying competence to personal training, research question number three is how do millennials describe com competence as a contributor to realizing their personal training goals? So my first question to you when we talk about competence then, um, actually, pardon me, let me back up. Let me first define what competence is as a um, is through self-determination theory. That is to seek control of an outcome and experience mastery. In other words, it's to master a skill. In this case, maybe it's how to master a certain technique of an exercise or master the proper diet and proper nutrition that goes into losing weight or properly losing body fat percentage. How one is, um, let's say, confident. That's another word that goes with competence a lot, how well they feel in terms of uh, mastering a skill. So with that, uh, with competence, can you please describe whether you had some degree of competence or to what degree your competence was zero, small, moderate, large when it comes to your personal training program? At first, before I started the personal training program, I was very confident in my moves. Okay. But as going through these steps with the trainer, uh -huh. the competence went down because he was pointing out certain areas where I was making mistakes that I would never know on my own. Okay. Um, when he pointed those mistakes out after working with that trainer, do you feel like you became more proficient and mastered those skills eventually later? Or uh, did you not uh, improve on those uh, techniques that he wanted you to do? It took a while. Uh, where I thought I was doing a movement correctly, basically I had to stop doing that movement in that particular way. And the gains that I got from that, it turned into just a, a lot more frustration when I had to start from all over, having to retrain the muscle group to move in the correct form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but over time it, it was, the correct form was a way of injury prevention. Okay. Um, and my original way, the I could have injured myself a lot easier had I kept on going that way. Mm, mm, interesting. You mentioned injury there, and I want to um, touch on that for a second, please. Um, how important is it for injury prevention and competency, how those are linked together for a personal training program on your own personal opinion? Was that important for you to ensure that you did not get injured and that you were competent before beginning your personal training program? Yeah, that was very important because if I got injured, I'd have to stop everything. Depending on how bad uh, injury could have been, I could have had to stop working. Mm -hmm. uh, then that would take away from what training I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and plus also too, and what successes I've had with that trainer, I could lose him because he could just move on. Uh, whether if the injury was from my own um, neglect, that would be the cause of it. Why he's always trying to tell me to do it correctly, then I'm just sitting there just um, doing, a, I want to say, doing the exercises incorrectly after he's corrected me so many different times. Mm -hmm. um, then once you're injured, it could take forever to get back into normal condition and some injuries I'm not, I wouldn't be able to recover from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let me ask you this. How capable do you feel now where you're at after working in your personal training program on preventing injuries and ensuring that you did those exercises the correct way? Capable. After meeting with the trainer, I'm a lot more capable of doing them correctly. Okay. He did teach me on ways to um, progress. Okay. Or to increase my weight and to where I'm not increasing too much weight to where I am doing it incorrectly or to where I think I can do a certain weight, but in, in, in actuality, I really can't. And he was pointing out to what to look out for. Okay. 
Okay, good. And how about, let's ask you this, um, looking at it now after working with your personal training program and building your competency, how well do you feel in terms of being able to successfully complete difficult and challenging tasks, like more challenging and difficult exercises, for example? How do you feel in terms of being able to successfully do that? At first, I thought I wouldn't be able to do it. Okay. But after going through uh, the training with a person or with my trainer, um, the adaptations that I made actually helped make these uh, more intense, more um, complex movements much easier and easier to attain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how about this? If there were any times where you ever felt like a failure because of a mistake that you made or that you were failing because of your own mistakes and um, your own um, problems that were causing those failures, what did that look like, if at all, if they existed? Did that ever happen? Um, not, not at first. Mm -hmm. But going through it, there, I did find some struggles with it where I would blame the trainer. Mm. Uh, but it's and, and from trying to push me too hard to where I couldn't do it. But later on, he would explain, he explained to me that that's what he was there for to push me past a point that I was not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, and he was pointing out what parts of my daily routines actually took away from that. So then he was sitting there saying, if you change this during the daytime, or for instance, eating, having bad nutrition on certain days could affect how the training would go on mm. or how my bad, uh, how the bad nutrition was affecting my um, goal attainment of, let's say, losing weight uh -huh. when I was eating too many, my, um, my dinners, like eating too late, too many sweets. Mm -hmm. so those, were, those were things he was pointing out where he was sitting there saying where he was trying to help me get past that point. Mm -hmm. I'm the one holding myself back and I was blaming him for it. Mm. How, to what degree is the competency then of the personal trainer um, and, you know, their competency assumption that they undertake when working with them? Is that pretty high? Is that moderate? Is it small? Like, to what level would you it, it, say? The competence with the trainer was moderate to high. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I didn't like is when he would actually take the videos of me. Mm -hmm. Then afterwards, he would sit there and just show me the video. And he, he, he said, was able to actually show me where I was making a mistake, where I was doing this wrong. Okay. Uh, where I, initially, I would just blame him for it. Okay. But he was actually showing me where the, to do the improvements for this exercise. But let's say when you're doing your squats, not having your knees go far too far out, he goes, try to control them as you go down and trying to keep your knees in a certain area. So with not liking that at first, when you look back at it now in retrospect, do you believe that type of uh, method that he was doing eventually helped build your competency level? It did because it, it what I thought I was doing correctly was, uh, I'm going to say about 70% correct. Uh -huh. but he was actually there when he took the videos of it. He was actually showing me where the other parts I was messing up on that I, I normally wouldn't see on my own. Mm. So he was actually not only telling me I'm making a mistake here, he was actually able to show me where I was making the mistakes. Mm -hmm. How about, let's talk about your emotions for a minute again. Uh, I want to tie that in. Uh, emotionally, were there any times where you might have just felt disappointed with yourself because of any of your performances? Yes, I'm going to say there have been a bit, couple times that when I was meeting with the trainers, now, depending on how my work day went, would affect how I would train, whether if it went good, some of the sessions were much better. Um, but when I got dragged down at work, or if had, having conflicts with others or something didn't go the way I wanted to at work, mm -hmm. I wasn't given the 100% in my training sessions. And, and I would sit there and try to, so I try to rationalize and try to blame others on it but it was really just me that was actually the problem for not getting um, certain goals in. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned a couple of times now about how work may interfere with your workouts and how 
if you're having a bad day, that might have played a role. Can you also th- give us any examples or think of any other uh, things that might have been outside your control, um, any external forces that interfered with your program to where maybe it, it even adversely affected your competency in your personal training program? Did that ever happen? Yeah, um, get stuck in traffic. That'll happen. Mm. So when you get stuck in traffic, mm-hmm. um, whether it was your fault or someone else's fault, or the, there's going to be com- 15 other things that could happen while you're driving that will get you frustrated. Uh-huh. And once you get frustrated and you get behind a little bit behind, behind schedule, mm-hmm. uh, then you get flustered. And then once you show up for your training session and you're all flustered, that can affect your training session there. Mm. And you also mentioned um, that word frustration again. Um, I, I remember a couple of minutes ago mentioning frustration when we were talking about autonomy. When you look at your competency level throughout your entire program, does it side more on the side of being overall satisfied with your goal attainment or does it side more on the side of frustration or is it somewhere in the middle or how would you answer that question? Um, can you repeat that again? Uh-huh. Given the choice between satisfaction versus frustration, when you look back at your personal training program, as it relates to competency, how your competency level now is versus when you started, are you, would you say more satisfied with your level of competency or more frustrated with your level of competency? More satisfied. And why is that, please? Uh, because I was able to... Uh, develop methods to do stuff on my own without the trainer there. Mm-hmm. Um, and with him showing me the correct way, I knew how to do it correctly mm-hmm. and what to look for. Now, if I was to get frustrated, if let's say I was doing an exercise incorrectly before the trainer mm-hmm. and, I, and I tried to add too much weight in the next one and I would sit there and not necessarily do a complete injury, but I might strain a muscle the next time. Mm-hmm. That would, that would lead to the frustration of what I was doing. But since meeting with the trainer, he, he'd give you some points to look at to where, let's say if um, you're doing an exercise and you start to see this, let's say this joint move a little bit too quick or um, sort of uh, turn inwards or outwards to stop what you're doing and then reduce the weight to actually get to a point where you can control that exercise. Interesting. And thus uh, then... I'm under the assumption that would lead to an increased level of your competency, which then would increase your level of satisfaction. Is that fair to assume? Yes, that is. Mm, Okay. Well, then let me ask you this. Um, When you look at competency as it is in your own personal training program, um, because of your competency, how successful were you in achieving your personal training goals overall? Um. I'm going to give it a total of 90, 95%. Uh-huh. I was able to achieve my goals. The, the part that I didn't was the neglect from my side okay. of not controlling the nutrition intake as much as I should have. So I take it then um, it's fair to me to assume that there should be some more learning to improve your competency in nutrition then? Yeah, there, there is a, there's a point of where the the trainer himself, he, he, he would give me general rules, uh-huh. but since he wasn't a nutritionist, he says he would not recommend that. Mm. He'll give me mm-hmm. direction on it, mm-hmm. but he's saying, well, you need to go do this. You need to go that. He wouldn't do that. Let me ask you this uh, hypothetical question. Then in this case, um, from everything you learned from your personal trainer, do you believe that you have the competency level now to turn around and be able to help educate, coach, train a novice beginner. If somebody was coming into the gym for the very first time and they had almost zero competency, they had never stepped foot in a gym, didn't know how to work out or exercise, how would your level of competency be to be able to help that person if you were the personal trainer? Uh, it would be a, a lot more. Uh huh. Um, but it also is that you got to take into the fact whether this person was um, does have any sports ability or not. Okay. Um, what I do see a lot of when when I do work out now is after the stuff I have learned from my trainer, mm-hmm. and, I, and I look around in the gym and stuff, and I do see a lot of other people that are making some of the same mistakes I made. Mm-hmm. But there are some people that I look at that have no 
uh, I'm going to say that that's the, I'm going to call it a sport gene mm -hmm. to where they can do athletics in them. Okay. Um, but they're trying to do it, but they're trying the wrong way. Mm -hmm. and, and to where, and those are some of the issues you would get with some of that. Now I could turn around and help them out. Okay. With just because of the stuff I have. Learned. Okay. Very good. Um, let's move forward then to, um, relatedness. This is the third of three components that are built in self-determination theory. Um, on the survey for relatedness, one of the questions asked, I feel close and connected with other people who are important to me. And once again, you scored high on that, meaning you were very aligned with that statement that that defined uh, completely true of who you are um, from your survey answer. So um, when we talk about relatedness, um, the relatedness defined by self-determination theory is the willingness to interact with, be connected to, and experience care for others. A synonym for relatedness then could be belongingness, or in other words, needing to feel belonged, wanting to be belonged. We're talking about now the relationship of yourself with your personal trainer. So research question number four then is how do millennials describe relatedness as a contributor to realizing their personal training goals? My question to you then is, can you please describe whether you had some degree of relatedness or to what degree your relatedness was, whether it was zero, small, moderate, large, in terms of your personal trainer? Um, the last trainer did well. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been around a couple of trainers I know, um, for instance, on the nutrition aspect, the last trainer I had, it wouldn't go over it. I know that sometimes I've interviewed with like, um, like when I started at Gold Gym, mm -hmm. they've got their trainers sitting there pushing nutrition programs. And I have no idea that they're even certified in that. Mm -hmm. I know they might be certified with personal training, but there's nothing showing that they know what they're talking about when it comes to nutrition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there, so not every trainer would work out with everyone. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd rather deal with someone that knows the knowledge of, uh, I'm going to say, of stuff that has actually been determined. Uh -huh. Instead of someone sit there says, well, I did this and this worked for me. You should do the same thing, too. Mm -hmm. um, but the last trainer I had where I got a lot more um, results from, he didn't do that. He said it, he was telling me that basically everyone's going to be a little bit into, I'm going to say, individuality. Mm -hmm. Not everyone reacts the same way there's a lot of similarities in those reactions but not everyone's mm. the same mm. Mm. okay well let's talk about the level of care for a minute then in that case uh let's look at the relationship you had with your personal trainer uh, you know and i know you've worked with more than one of them but what did that level of mutual care look like between you and um any of your personal trainers do you feel that there was a a mutual care that you cared for them and that they cared just as much for you during the relationship? That, that would be, um, wasn't around the trainer much, but except for when I was training with him. Mm -hmm. um, but what, when I was there training with him, I was the one he was paying attention to. He wasn't paying attention to anything from the background. Mm -hmm. I've had other trainers where they would, um, not only they, they give you about 70% of their attention, but they're always else looking around. Mm -hmm. um, many, many years ago, I did so I started with a trainer that um, he would start to start me on an exercise, then he would disappear. And I would find him looking at the girls in the uh, doing the aerobics class. Oh, <laughs> well, um, so that uh, would then I'm in. Uh, it sounds like to me in that case, that last trainer you described did not have a high level of uh, relatedness uh, from what I gather. Is that no, fair to say? Not at all because he wasn't focus focusing on the, uh, me as a client. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He had his attentions going elsewhere. Mm. Uh, the last trainer I did have, he did much better. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I was with him, he would focus on me. Mm -hmm. Um, let me ask you this. What, um, how about the warmth and, uh, you know, we talked about care, but the warm and closeness of being able to work with a personal trainer, is that important for, uh, that relationship to be one of warmth and closeness 
Does that not matter? Is it somewhere in the middle? What does that look like? The warmth and closeness of working with it's personal me, it's training. Not a, it's, that's not a big priority. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm with the, when I was with the last trainer, I mm -hmm. want him to be attentive to me and know mm -hmm. what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I don't need to be BFFs with him. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just, it, um, but as long as I'm training with him, I want him to help me get past certain barriers. Mm -hmm. Um, and also I want him to get onto me if I'm doing something incorrectly. Mm -hmm. What about, were there any times that you ever felt that you had a personal trainer that left you with the impression that they did not enjoy the time that they spent with you during your workout sessions? Yeah, this would probably go back to that first one that were, was always wandering off to the aerobics room. Mm -hmm. I, I did not get the, I want to say closeness or the attitude like he, he was there to help me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, then there's a couple of trainers that, that were there that didn't have the, um, I didn't have a connection with it, but they knew what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. Then I had the, the last trainer I had, he was there, he knew what he was talking about. And not, it's not like I hung around him all the time, but out of it, when I was there, he focused on me and made sure I was doing things correctly. So in that last example, then, um, that trainer sounds like he had a high level of relatedness. And my question to you then is how important is there for that relationship between you and the trainer to have more of a deeper, uh, relationship rather than it just being superficial in a business transaction? Um, I'd rather have it to be a little bit deeper, mm -hmm. um, because, what I'm thinking about as for being superficial or, or deep is when I'm there, he's just concentrated on me, no one else, but me mm -hmm. as compared to having someone that's, that's focusing on me then, but also has is easily, um, how would you say that, that easily loses attention. Mm -hmm. How about when you first began in this field with looking for a personal trainer and working on your program for yourself, um, how important was this whole concept of relatedness to you in terms of when you started working with your personal trainer? Was that very important? Uh, and if so, how did that look like uh, for that degree of relatedness for you to have with a personal trainer that you worked with? It, it was a big thing because mm. I wanted to work with someone that I could actually get along with instead of someone I didn't get along with. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though that I can get along with this person, it made it a lot easier and getting along with that person doesn't mean they're going to, I'm going to do everything they say. Mm -hmm. It's a, I'm going to, I'll, I'll still question things as we go along, mm -hmm. but I, I want him there to have me going towards a certain goal. And I can see the little small steps that are helping me get to there, mm -hmm. but I also don't want to deal with someone that's still going to sit there and say, well, do this, do that. I, I go, well, I don't like that enough. We'll do it anyways. So then uh, from what you just said, is it important then for a, your trainer to kind of say, practice what they preach and lead by example? Is that what you're kind of saying with that last to, statement? To a certain, to a certain point. Mm -hmm. um, so when we start on these exercises and stuff, it, even though um, I've come across trainers that might not look the role, but they actually get down there and do the role mm -hmm. as compared to some of these trainers that look like they've been in shape their whole life, but they've that's their genetics and they really don't do much, but they just look the part. And so then would you say, would you relate more to the first type of trainer that you said about the ones who will get down in the trenches and show you, do you think there's uh, more of a relatedness there with that trainer rather than the uh, other type where, you know, they don't get down and show you the exercises? Yeah, because I want to, I want to work with someone that's going to be able to show me what I'm doing wrong or show me how to do it correctly mm -hmm. as compared to someone that will just sit there and say, well, just go ahead and just bench it. Is that as, then you'll get someone that'll sit there and say, well, I want you to do this. I want you to push in this area. I want you to focus on, let's say when you're doing your, when I'm doing my bench press, focus on your chest in this area, then focus on your arms when you get to this point. So someone like that, it sounds like you could relate to them better. Is that why? Yeah. Yes, that would be. Mm -hmm. because it shows me that they've actually spent time learning how to do these movements mm -hmm. as compared to someone that just thinks you already know it. 
then in that case, would you say, uh, let's flip it around for a second. You mentioned how you could relate to them better because of that. Do you think that trainer who you just described relates to you better as well? Just the same, the, uh, the mutual way? Uh, pretty much because it's not everyone comes out looking like the model over here. Mm -hmm. Everyone's always changing. There's always, not only are you going through your motion, your trainer's got other stuff he goes through too. Mm -hmm. There could be some times where he's just running real tired and he just grabs something quick to eat and turns around and it just ends up being bad for him. Mm -hmm. um, but I would rather deal with someone that's actually gone. It makes it a lot easier to relate to that person when they go through the same steps you're going through. Well, I, I know I, I, I'm going to say when he was down there explaining it, he goes, I know how you feel this here because I went from this point to this point. Mm -hmm. and I'm just helping you do the same. Mm. Um, those are the ones that you're going to find the relatedness to a lot better over the ones that didn't have to take those steps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Well, let me ask you then this question to kind of tie in relatedness here. Uh, looking at uh, that word relatedness and in your entire personal training program, um, then how would you say how successful were you in achieving your personal training goals thanks to relatedness? A lot. Hmm. Very high. Um, that was going to be a very high uh, mark up there. Because when you're related to someone or the, when the trainer was relating some of the issues they had, mm -hmm. he, he's actually able to explain a couple different modifications that I could take okay. just to help get past this point when I was just hitting a brick wall every time. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Good. Um, then let's kind of take a, into account and summarize these three concepts that we've just talked a lot about here. We talked at in depth and at length about your own autonomy, your own competence, and your own relatedness as it is in your personal training program. My question to you is comparing yourself to other millennials, that's anyone else who's your age from your generation, how does your generation compare then to the other generations in terms of those concepts that have to do with self-determination. For example, how does your generation, the millennials compare to, let's say the baby boomers, the older generation or vice versa? How do they compare to the younger uh, generation coming up now? Uh, I guess they're called generation Z, the people born after the millennials. Uh, how do the millennials compare in terms of self-determination? I want to say there's a little bit better um, on their self-determination. It's always gonna break down to the individual Mm -hmm. As you can, in each group, uh, whether if you're the baby boomers, the millennials, the generation Zs, mm -hmm. you're going to have a couple of people that are, there's going to be a certain percentage of them that are real determined to do stuff mm -hmm. as compared to some of them that it came naturally to. So they don't have to put that um, extra step in there. Mm -hmm. Now, then also too, in the, the uh, let's say the millennials, the baby boomers, as the they're a little bit older than the generation Z's. They could come across medical issues that they have where the fitness aspect will actually help them out much better. Mm -hmm. And in saying that they're, you know, maybe more individualized in looking at how their self-determination is, how about yourself? How do you individually compare to the other generations when comparing your self-determination? For example, is your self-determination lower, higher, same uh, compared to the other generations? Probably a little bit on the higher side. Mm -hmm. um, just because I've got issues that I deal with daily. Mm -hmm. as, the, as the better shape I get into, the less problems I get from them. Okay. Mm, okay, good. Excellent. Well, um, I'd like to now move forward to confirming your demographic information, please. Um, uh, by the way, excellent uh, answers on all of my interview questions. Um, did very, very well, and um, I understand everything in clarity here. Um, let me go ahead and confirm here a few things. We have um, on the demographic questionnaire, uh, male, 37 years old, white Caucasian. Yes. And uh, when asking how long you had been working out with a personal trainer, you answered at least two years up to three years? Yes, I believe so. 
Okay. And then on the demographic questionnaire, we asked on average, how many times do you work out with a personal trainer? You answered uh, two times per week. Yes. Okay. And then on the body fat percentage, uh, beginning at 23%, ending at 18% with a net loss of 5% body fat during the program. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, the body weight that you lost uh, up to the point of your personal training program, beginning at 220 pounds, ending 205 pounds with a total loss of 15 pounds. Yes. Um, right. Now also too, is, I'm going to say there's a uh, muscle mass that I actually increased during that time frame too. Mm, good point. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. That That's a very right. good point. So, yeah. so it wasn't just like I lost 15 pounds. Mm -hmm. It could have been maybe 20 to 25 pounds of fat. I lost. Sure. I did add a little bit more muscle. Mm hmm. Um, and I didn't see that on your form here. Yeah, that's a good point. Right. When you take that into account. Um, and we were going on goal attainment by a composite of, uh, again, for example, how we got you on this survey to do the interview was we were looking at people's body fat percentage and then taking that into account with their body weight. And then the average of both of those percentages we took and matched it to how high you scored on the self-determination um, survey that you did. And from there, we came up with an ultimate final composite um, number. So again, well done. Great job on that. Um, as we're nearing the end here, uh, let me turn the interview around to you, please. Uh, do you have any additional comments you'd like to make? Or are there any questions you have about the interview? About the interview, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, again, um, I want to thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm going to close out the interview with a few points here. Um, I did mention this before we started recording, but I do want to let you know that your input here is uh, very valuable. It is going towards my own dissertation that I'm attempting to get published and defend uh, hopefully successfully and get approved within the next couple months sometime in March. And um, I will make sure that you get a copy of that final dissertation. Uh, that way, you're going to get an overview of everything when we put all of these um, data together of the surveys and the interviews. You're going to basically see how you compare and match up um, with your profile, with the other millennials, with all of these composite scores that we've been talking about. And you'll also be able to get the audio copy and also audio transcript of our interview together. I will send that to you as soon as possible. And I'd like you to please do something that we call member checking. I'd like you to please check for accuracy that all of the answers you provided us were true and meaningful to your uh, best of abilities. If, for example, you listen to the audio or you read the transcript and you hear or see something that didn't uh, come out the way you wanted it, or if you forgot something and you wanted to edit it or clarify it, it gives us time to go back and we can modify it as needed and revise it before we finalize um, and publish the study. So please let me know. We'll keep in contact on that. And um, that way uh, you can get any information you want um, as it uh, has to do with this uh, study. But um, other than that, um, before I stop the recording, one more time, any final comments on the interview, the survey, or any of the questions? No, not, none at all. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to hit the stop button right now. Mm -hmm.